Ladies and gentlemen, I am Pradeep Monga. I am Director of Energy and Climate Change, UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development Organization, based in Vienna. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this evening session on Sustainable Development Goal Number 7. On behalf of all four co-lead agencies, UNIDO, International Atomic Energy Agency, UNEP and UNECE. Let me extend you a very warm welcome to this very important session at COP22. Thank you so much for making your time and commitment to be part of this session at this late hour. COP meetings are always very stressful, time consuming, but I always see the hardcore people, they are present on all those sessions which matter them close to their heart, but also which matter most to the world. Since in 2015, we had sustainable development goals adopted in New York in September, and we had historic Paris Agreement. So in COP22, all sustainable development goals were given one session, where UN system-wide approach can be taken to address issues related to that SDG, or Sustainable Development Goal. And SDG 7 is Sustainable Energy for All. And I'm very happy that uh, uh, we have been given this task of co-leading co this session along with other agencies. And I'm very happy that my, my colleagues have asked me to moderate this session for really benefit and contribution to COP22. COP22 is happening at a very historic time. We have SDGs in place. We have Paris Agreement in place. But now it's time for action. Time to do translate words into reality. Time to translate agreement action on the ground. Time to translate vision of the global leaders, scientific community, all partners, all stakeholders into uh, a world, a sustainable world, sustainable future, where we can address global challenge of climate change, but at the same time, we could also address and meet goals, sustainable development goals, and of course, indicators for SDG 7 are very clear. We need access to energy worldwide by 2030. There are 1.3 billion people still have no access to modern energy. Renewable energy is moving very fast. Agenda is moving very fast. But at the same time, still fossil fuels and other technologies, clean technology will play a very important role in years to come. So what should be the transitional technology and what should be the transformative long-term technologies we are looking at? And third, and most importantly, what are the ways to go forward, having action on the ground. So we are very happy that we are part of this COP22 movement here, present in Marrakesh, and looking at action on the ground, <coughs> implementation on the ground. And here, as UN agencies, we decided that while it is very important to really give our thoughts, our views, share our knowledge, experience with partners, with participants, with delegates. It's very important we also hear from youth, future leaders, young people, people with some experience together, and so that they can give us a clue what they look at for sustainable future when we talk about energy and climate change. Of course, anybody who's following debate on energy and climate change for the last couple of years is very clear, including what we are talking in, in, in in um, Paris, three things came out very clearly. Thank you. Technology transfer, financing, and of course, uh, we are talking about private sector. How do we bring these three things together? How we can really focus on technology transfer, how we are bringing financing on table, and how we are looking at uh, partnerships, translating action on the ground. And here, we find that innovation is a cross-cutting theme in all SDGs and climate action. 
innovation not in terms of technologies but innovation also in terms of financing issues innovation also in terms of social engineering involving communities people stakeholder on the ground on the other hand nexus becomes very very important do we look at energy in isolation all of us know that energy systems contribute over 60 percent of greenhouse gases so it means energy systems are part of the problem but they can be also part of the solution like every crisis we can see in any crisis we also can see an opportunity so climate change also gives us a, an opportunity all of us to move into green technologies green systems clean energy systems green jobs green homes green industry a green economy for a sustainable future for all of us so i'm very happy and pleased that we have a wonderful panelists here who are present with their experiences some of them are very young some of them some experience i said i'll introduce them one by one because that's where we want to hear from them the whole uh, uh, topic of this session is meeting the two degree challenge nexus of innovation and clean energy in fact when we want to say meeting the two degree challenge all of us also believe it's possible that we can have meeting the challenge of even 1.5 degree but even to meet two degree what are things we need to be in place technology wise financing wise partnership wise where we can move into that direction and here i have uh, this six speakers uh, from different parts of the world with different background and let me introduce them and uh, introduce them now gradually one on our right is Ms. Paseka Leselang, founder and CEO of WSC, Water, Hygiene and Convenience. He's from South Africa. He's the CEO of this company, which was established at the age of 18. You can see uh, his, uh, his zeal for really making a difference through private sector, through a company looking at linking water, hygiene and convenience. He was our, one of the winners of 2014 global clean tech innovation program started in south africa in 2011 under this program we win we have a, a very uh, competitive process in uh, several countries and each country come up with 200 to 300 applicants and who are innovating in clean technologies especially energy systems and from them we we choose three winners so he was one of the three winners in south africa in 2014 and I'm very happy that he could find time to be part of that. He, he has been part of several entrepreneurial ventures. And of course, he has co-founded co also a photo company uh, for 500 customers we, while he managed them also. So this is a very multi various activity he has done. Now he's working on, of course, he has done a business administration uh, leadership program and working on some of the issues. Perhaps when he's addressing this two degree challenge, he will see, he'll try to explain why his company or his experience shows that uh, we can meet this challenge through nexus and innovation. Then I have uh, Lenka Kola, Director of Business Strategy at Nuke Scale Power. At her work, very interesting. In UN system, and I'm sure at COP22, we must say that when we want to meet the challenge of sustainable energy fall, SDG 7, we are very clear that all technologies are on table. As UN system, we are agnostic about that. But only proviso is the technology should be clean, should meet the needs of the countries, and as per the priority of the country. So again, we have a very good model uh, here. Like she promotes nuclear scale small modulator reactor to be market through business plan development and clean energy outreach. In some countries, Nuclear power is still the mainstay. France is a very good example. In some countries, it is phasing out. In some countries, they want to go forward it. Uh, in Vienna, we see when we have Atomic Energy Agency General Conference, we see presence of all 190 plus countries. And most of the countries are aspirant to have nuclear power. But again, how do we really have that energy mix where nuclear power can continue to play a very important role? For instance, in Indian context, it's very clear, or many other contexts, nuclear power for some years to come will play a very important role, even if solar and wind and others are moving very fast. 
we have your pascal here secretary general terawatt initiative one of the co-founders of uh, solar direct also in charge of strategic and corporate projects business innovation climate affairs corporate social responsibility as secretary general of uh, terawatt initiative he advocates internationally for a global common market of competitive solar power of course linking to sustainable development goals and paris agreement terawatt is a terawatt we need terawatt to meet our global challenge of energy poverty very interesting and he feels it can be done by solar energy i'm sure and other renewables it will be very good to hear from him on that then we have eric mayer founder executive director of generation atomic from california he has dedicated his life to building grassroots movement needed to save and expand nuclear power very interesting so again we'll hear from him why at this young age he is committed so much to a, a technology which is uh, which has a lot of uh, global implications but at the same time can address energy poverty climate change and other issues simultaneously so it will be very good to hear from him he while pursuing his master's degree from advocacy and political leadership from university of minnesota he started the energy task force in his chapter of minnesota public interest research group wow so he has a he has been a an activist right from his student days and that's very good to hear from him now we have kanika chawla i know kanika chawla when she was working at rent 21 in paris very strong advocate of renewable energy pushing for renewable energy in every sphere of life with application with use by industry by home households and others and of course she specializes in international cooperation and renewable energy finance at present she is working as senior program lead at the council on energy environment and water in india again you can see while she can speak very well on renewables but also she has a very good overview of energy water and of course environment and nexus but i was saying how not to deal energy in in a, in a silo in isolation energy must be dealt with water food security and of course uh, ecosystem sustainability and of course i have a young colleague in my view he's still young of course he doesn't agree with me bramley lindong is a founder and chief executive of world view impact foundation bromley worked with me as intern in 99 2000 and time has just flown i have seen he was just young undergraduate from india and worked with me then he went to lsc he went to columbia he went to be doing phd in mexico he has done wonderful things and now he is back in part of india to do his foundation and again he is linking agriculture security with renewable energy systems with energy efficiency and other tech especially involving community to do action on the ground so you can see we have six leaders present to the podium since it is late in the evening i will request them that we want this debate to be forceful give out your mind give us what you believe in and why you feel your thoughts your contribution can make a difference we don't want business as usual statements we want business unusual statements from you why you feel you can your thoughts your contribution can make a difference in the sphere of energy and climate change and that's why we are here in cop 22 especially action on the ground i think so two speakers have asked they want to show some slides but again please remember your in initial statements will be 3 to 4 minutes and then we'll take on from the questions and see how energy level in this hall to really pursue those thoughts further will be absolutely guided by your energy level your questions so be ready with that because that will be my approach to have more interactive so without further ado let me start with first speaker to really put energy in this hall mr pasika let's so see of wsc please go ahead floor is yours thank you very much mr program director good evening everyone Um, as per the introduction, my name is Pascal Solang from South Africa, and um, I run a company called WHC. It stands for Water Hygiene Convenience. Water is our substance focus. Hygiene represents the green economy that we serve. 
convenience is the innovative technologies and services that we provide to that regard. Our benchmark technology is the WHC leakless valve. All right, now all of this is coming as absurd to you. What is a water person doing in an energy environment? Well, basically, I'm here to give the correlation of water to energy and how quintessential the two are. That's the first objective. The second objective is to give my input on how to commercialize ideas which are impactful to the world. Uh, I myself have uh, come across an innovation from solving a typical problem in my grandparents' house. I converted that idea to an international viable business. It started off in the garage of my grandparents' house. Today, we are a multinational award-winning uh, technology company. So I'm here to share my views on how such ideas can also be self-sustainable and also make business sense. You see, money is not the most important thing, but it ranks up there with oxygen. So we definitely need to see the correlation of such things in this environment. As part and parcel of my correlation of water to energy, I'd like to bring about two typical examples that we take for granted. At least in my country, the main energy supplier is the single largest water consumer in the country. This is because, yes, they burn the fossil fuel to boil water. This water is converted to steam. The steam turns the turbines. However, the steam is lost. We're consuming over 2 million liters of water a day with this process, whereas we could reticulate such water. That's one correlation which I foresee we can work around. Another typical analysis or observation I've, 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 I've done is whenever there's a leak that enters our network, which is subject to retreatment and redistribution in our country, it costs the municipality at least 700,000 US dollars to treat one megaliter of water. So that's around about one million liters. Now, back to my original technology, one megaliter of, of water is due to 1,500 to 50,000 leaking toilets. Now think about it, before we go too abstract, what I'm trying to get to is our country alone has over 12 million toilets which will inevitably leak. When you think of how much water is entering the sanitation network, if the value of energy required to treat just 1,500 liters worth of leaking toilets is 700,000 US dollars, how much, much, how much money and energy are we actually losing in the process? So such technologies like the WHC leakless valve, which we introduce, is what we call subconscious, eco-conscious technologies. These are the kind of technologies that are easy to use, easy to install. They are disruptive, but not destructive. Such technologies are required in the energy space, which are easily scalable anywhere and everywhere in the world in order for us to meet this nexus or to reduce the, the, the rising temperatures of, of, uh, that, that are due to climate change. So ladies and gentlemen, I'll be sharing my views on these two facets along this conversation. And uh, without further ado, I'd also like to mention that as much as this technology is a mere technology in the household, I've managed to create 26 jobs, managed to save at least 20,000 liters of water within one toilet, and now we are rolling out this technology from one city to another in South Africa. We have interest all over the world, and I believe that such methodologies are required to actually meet the energy situation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, 
linking energy to water use and especially example in south africa of course we can go second round of discussion since it is a you know, first couple of minutes for statements let me start now with second speaker linka kolar let us have your views why you feel that small modular reactor could be a very good business model linking to energy and climate change please floor yours thank you my name is Lenka Kolar, and I am the Director of Business Strategy at New Scale Power. Uh, we're a company based in Oregon in the United States, and we started research in the early 2000s into enhancing the safety and efficiency of existing nuclear reactor technology. So what we've done is created a, a smaller nuclear reactor that can be deployed in a way where multiple reactors are put on a site to provide not just electricity, but other energy uses. And the reason why this could be a game-changing technology is because it has the potential to provide electricity and other and things like clean water on a much larger scale um, than other energy technologies can in places where it makes sense. Uh, not too long ago, Bill Gates said that we need an energy miracle. I would argue that we actually already have existing energy technologies that are in various stages of research and development that are ready to be, or close to ready to being deployed. But where the funding lacks and the resources lack for these energy technologies are in that deployment phase. There are about 50 other companies in the United States that are developing some sort of nuclear technology. And there needs to be a better roadmap in terms of how to bring these technologies to market. We have a lot of barriers in the nuclear industry. They include things like regulation and siting and public acceptance. And even though we have this great technology that can provide electricity and water to places where it hasn't been before, there are a lot of barriers to bring that technology to market. Um, there are a few uh, things that have happened recently from the Paris Agreement and from COP21, including Mission Innovation, which has brought together 19 countries to double energy R&D. And this is great, but it needs to be done in, more, in a much uh, more direct than high level. Because if you say that you're going to do this on a high level, you need to not only be investing in R&D at the early stages, but also making sure that these technologies have a pathway to get to the market and be able to be deployed. Um, speaking of deployment, I think one of the particular things that the US has done that will prove, hopefully prove to be successful is creating public-private partnerships um, with energy companies. And so this is something that we've participated in, in which the US Department of Energy has pledged funding to us, and we found matching funding from the private sector um, on the order of 200, over $200 million each in order to get our technology through the licensing process and then to be able to build the first plant in the US and to expand internationally from there. And the unique thing that SMRs, small modular reactors, can really provide is innovation in financing. So it's not just the innovation in the technology, but the innovation in how we're going to pay for it that needs to happen. And in this model, you can, for example, build uh, two of the modules in the nuclear power plant and then scale up from there as needed. So you can start producing electricity and paying off that initial capital cost before scaling up the power plant and having the funding to build the rest. So this is an innovative business model that we've come up with and something that we need help in fostering. There also needs to be innovation in how we use energy. Uh, as my colleague on the left mentioned here, water is very important, and desalination is something that's used around the world that is now powered by fossil fuels. So one thing that we've looked at is trying to figure out how hybrid energy systems would work in which you're using both nuclear and renewables, load following with the electricity load, um, also using the excess energy or excess heat from the nuclear plant to power other industrial processes or desalination to create clean water. So the point I really want to drive here is that we need to decarbonize both 
industrial nations and also help bring affordable and clean carbon-free electricity and clean water to developing countries. And we're going to need all energy sources to be able to do this. And I think that nuclear, innovative nuclear technology and especially small modular reactors can really fill the gap in where this energy is coming from. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very interesting uh, argument you have put forward. Of course, I was going through your background once again and uh, given your BSc master's in nuclear energy, I could really see you have a very good overview of uh, this technology as well as your business administration background gives you a very strong communication approach so far as uh, promoting this modular technology. Now let's move to other areas of clean energy systems. John, Paul, uh, John, John Pascal is Secretary General Terawatt Initiative, very well-known initiative. We are talking terawatt power through solar. So tell us, John Pascal, what do you think about it? Can we achieve it? in the given circumstances of financing and technology advancements. Please, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me tonight, or this evening. Well, it's almost nine now. Um, yeah. We are entrepreneurs. We have been through uh, the development of solar uh, over the last decade, and we have seen what it is actually. And we, are, we were really, really enthusiastic uh, when last year the Sustainable Development Goals has been uh, decided and the Paris Agreement has been met, reached. But now as entrepreneurs, we ask ourselves how we will do it and how, how much it represents, because we are talking about technologies and everything, but how much is it? And we made a rough calculation and say, well, just to stick from the energy sector to the 450 ppm, that would mean for solar that there's 2.5 terawatt to be installed in, five, in 10 coming years. 2.5 terawatts is 2.5 trillion dollar investment. <laughs> and it's 700 megawatts per day starting January 1st, 2017. That's pretty much huge. The good news is uh, that we can rely now on market forces. And this is where I'm very happy to be here because there's, when you, like, when you ask about the question about innovation, what is the innovation as to, the first innovation that we have to make is the innovation in a mindset. We have to change the way we, th we see things and we do things because if we do things that we are doing right now, we will never achieve targets. But if we change our mindset and we look at what is possible and we look in details and how to, 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 to solve this new equation, it is solvable. And the, why is it solvable? Because we can rely on market forces. We can rely on the fact that now solar is able to deliver 30 dollars a megawatt and will be able to, to deliver very soon less than that. And when you are at this level of cost of electricity, it's a game changer. It's a massive game changer, and it is more uh, economic than any kind of other power generation. So that means that market forces, people will choose naturally solar, not because it is solar, not because it is clean, but just because it is cheaper. The thing is, how can we do that? How can we do that? How can we replicate what Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Chile, Mexico, and others have done this year? How can we do that? Back to basics, back to the financial model. And that's what we have been doing for 10 years, looking at the age details of the cost of the solar electricity. And we know that in solar electricity, the, 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 there's two main issues, the capex and the cost of capital. The capex is always the same everywhere, modular the regulation. It's always the same everywhere because it's a commodity. It's very low technology, very simple. There's very low IP and you can buy um, solar modules and solar equipment everywhere in the world. It's very easy. On the other side, you have uh, the cost of capital. The cost of capital is absolute, is enormous. Whether you have a very, it's like a printer. Look at, think about a printer. A printer, when you go to the to the to the IP store, IT IT store, you buy a printer and it's very cheap. But then you have to buy a lot of cartridge of ink if you want to print. 
and then you have a low investment, but you have a lot of OPEX. The solar is exactly the contrary. You have to buy a printer which would have all the cartridges for, uh, for 30 years, and you have to pay it from the, first, the day one. And then all you do is very low OPEX and very simple. So basically, the cost of capital is a huge influence on, on the cost of electricity because you have to pay everything from day one. So that means that from a country to another, you can have like 30, 40 dollars a megawatt hour to 200, 300, depending on the cost of capital. And why is the cost of capital so different from a country to another? Mainly because of the risk perception. And what I think innovation and change in mindset should be now, and what we need now is changing the, the, the thinking of, it's not really the technology that matters, it's the way we, we see the risks in the financing of solar energy. And if we find ways, and I will explain later uh, how we think we can do achieve that, uh, if we find ways to have low cost capital everywhere, to finance solar power everywhere, then you will have $30 a megawatt hour of solar, of solar power everywhere. And when you get to that, you have such a huge market forces that decarbonization and energy access, because energy access is also providing affordable electricity, electricity, then you can reach at the same time the two goals. But now the question for us, from our point of view in solar, is not a matter of technology, it's a matter of financing. Thank you so much, Eric. I'm oh, sorry, uh, Joe Pascal, for, for your intervention on Terawatt Initiative. Eric, now, for yours, I understand you have a couple of slides, and you said there was all 15-second slides. So good. Uh, we are looking forward to your grassroots movement needed to save and expand nuclear power. Wow. I never seen this word being used for nuclear power, grassroots level. <laughs> I know, maybe that's, <laughs> that's an, interesting. That's uh, an innovation so, in itself, right? <laughs> yes. So this yeah. is what I say. Innovation need not be technology-wise. It can be also yeah. social engineering-wise. And given your background, unlike uh, uh, other colleague, uh, Lenka, you are not from technology background. You are more from you know, uh, policy background. So Eric, let us hear from you. Let's hope you can download your slides. All right, maybe that'll work. Um, ah. At any rate, um, yeah, I, uh, I used to be anti-nuclear, actually. Um, I thought it was uh, uh, too dangerous, too expensive, et cetera, et cetera, fill in the blank, because um, everything I knew about nuclear had come from The Simpsons, basically. Um, and then it, it was a video about an advanced type of reactor, which um, I'm happy to say some of which, many of which are in development right now. Uh, this one was called a molten salt reactor. And, uh, and I think the thing about it that, that uh, I was excited about was the, the potential to consume existing nuclear waste as fuel and also to make them in factories and ship them to places in the, in the developing world. Um, I do want to show a few slides here. So I wonder if I can do it like this. Yes, sir. Uh, please. Yeah. Um, all right. So that should pop up in a second. But the reason why I'm no longer working on advanced right now is because I'm aware of the, uh, the crisis that's, that's currently happening with the existing fleet. And I, I can't think of any real examples throughout history that uh, these advanced, advanced anything has emerged, innovation has emerged from a dying industry. So how, how bad is it right now as far as our climate goals? So we see that uh, global low, low uh, carbon power has grown in absolute terms, but declined as a percentage of total electricity. Um, so part of that is just because we're adding more people to the grid, which I think is a good thing. Um, how much is 4.5% percentage points? That's a lot, 60 nuclear plants the size of Diablo Canyon. Um, part of the global decline in clean energy is from the decline of nuclear. Um, and it hasn't been made up for from uh, balance, uh, adding sol additional solar and wind. So as a percentage, our, our world, we, you know, we, we, we pat each other on the back and say we're, we're making progress here, but our energy has been getting dirtier uh, over the last years here. Um, in the US, over the last three years, we lost five nuclear plants to economic reasons, um, and that's almost the exact amount of power that we generated from our entire solar sector last year. 
Um, so we've, we've erased all climate benefits from solar from loss of nuclear to mainly to fracked, fracked gas and uh, some renewables mandates, economic pressures. Uh, globally, the situation is also pretty bad. We're going, going backwards here. We've got 132 gigawatts at high risk of being lost. Um, and it, it, it's hard for me to believe we're going to be able to put pow power back on the grid at the rate we need to to address climate change. So, so what do we do? We, we march, as you can see us here in San Francisco. Um, we have rallies. This is at the New York Clean Energy Standard. Uh, we were able to get nuclear included save three plants, roughly two million cars worth of carbon emissions. Um, we rally and, uh, and, and we do sit-ins too. And this, this is in Illinois, um, outside of an anti-nuclear lobby group. And I'm happy to say that today, this bill um, to save two nuclear plants in Southern Illinois uh, did pass out of committee and it looks very promising. So that would be an additional uh, two million cars worth of carbon dioxide that were avoided um, because because we work to save these plants, um, so I guess uh, and you know we lobby we lobby state legislators too. It's not all direct advocacy. Um, so I guess the main innovation piece for me right now is an innovation in the way we think about nuclear energy. Um, every room I go into at COP 22, and it's probably even worse at COP 21 when I went last year. Uh, nuclear is the elephant in the room. And it's, it provides uh, the largest source of carbon-free energy in the U.S. and in Europe. And we just kind of kind of write it off um, for, I think, not some great reasons and not some very pragmatic reasons. Um, so we need to think about how we can innovate and get to the place. Um, we've got to innovate in, in the discourse uh, so we can start talking about it again. And then I think we have to innovate uh, technologically. So... Um, so we can have the, the low carbon power that we can that can be ubiquitous around the world and we can have the future that we all want and dream of. So that's what I've been working on. Thanks. Thank you so much, Eric. Very, very interesting arguments, of course, uh, based on evidence very clearly. And of course, on the second round, we'll come back to you. Until we really bring them together. And that's where the challenge comes. Kanika, over to you. Uh, give us your perspective on energy, especially from Nexus as well as from a clean energy perspective. Please, yeah. floor yours. Thank you, Mr. Monga. Um, the word Nexus always makes me think of Venn diagrams, the ones we did in school. And in a way, this session is really like two Venn diagrams, where one circle is the, the seventh SDG goal of um, energy access for all in a safe, affordable, and sustainable manner. And the other circle is the two degree challenge, right? And really at the, at the overlap of those two um, circles and then the center of that when, I think the most obvious choice is renewable energy, which is not to disagree with um, what um, um, Eric and Lenka have said before, and I think really the, the scale of the challenge is so large that we need it all. But renewable energy is safe, it is affordable, and it's, it meets the, I mean, it, it sort of, so it meets your uh, energy access needs, it meets your energy security needs, and it tackles climate change. So it's really hard for me to understand why more is not happening. But then I've really thought about it and done a bunch of research on this, and what I really think is the answer is the need for innovation. And the innovation isn't just technological. In fact, it is probably the least reliant now on technology games, because the technology exists. And to some extent, in the last decade, we have seen great policy uh, innovation as well. We have seen new processes in the way that um, energy uh, or renewable energy capacity is auctioned, which has brought down prices. Yet there's still something amiss, which is why we're not moving as fast as we possibly could. We are moving fast. We just could be moving yeah. much faster. Thank you. And the reason for that, I think, is because we're not thinking. We need innovation in our thinking, in our perception, in our behavior. But really, I think that that can be broken down into several other pieces. So I think we need innovation in finance. We need innovation in business models. We need innovation in technology applications of renewable energy, and we need innovation in institutions. 
And I'm going to speak very briefly about each of those. So on finance, I think we've heard a lot about the, the risks that exist and, and the kind of investments that are required. But there is a lot of money entering the capital market every single year, $12 trillion on last count. A lot of that money is not reaching renewable energy. Yet in forums such as this, we discuss the $100 billion floor in the, in the GC, or that the UNFCCC-based financing instruments need to leverage. And while I think that that money absolutely needs to be put on the table, what is that money going to do? Have you really thought about how we can leverage that money to really make, instead of just using $100 billion to install 100 gigawatts, can we use that to get to the terawatt scale? And the answer is yes, we can. It is only about designing financial instruments that will leverage that money and allow it to have a multiplier effect. The second innovation is on business models. And I think a lot of this is happening in a, in a way that is so disaggregated that we don't even know the level of innovation that already exists. The decentralized renewable energy market is the most inventive market that I have per personally seen in a very long time. Just the, the piggybacking on existing networks, the, the Use, uh, driving behavioral change through, through incentives and, and, um, and, and mechanisms that are actually so intuitive that have not yet that sort of the technology and the policy speak have inhibited all of us from even thinking about. And one such example is really an um, a instrument that I find most interesting, which is called warehousing, which aggregates demand, sort of gives all of the projects that are within this aggregated demand one single certificate and allows big money to flow into small projects. That is an example of the inventiveness that was going to drive the revolution. The third area in which I think we need a lot of innovation is in the institutions that are driving this change. A revolution cannot be driven by policymakers alone, and it's not going to be driven by new um, developers and, and new industry alone. There needs to be facilitators for this revolution. And that's where institutions like the Terawatt Initiative can play such a large role. That's where institutions like REN21, the, the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water, and everybody who's willing to think out of the box, who's willing to think in a way that is new, that is that refuses to let sort of the, the shackles of the system that we live in bind us down. And then there is the fourth one, which is on technology applications. And so a lot of, in, and, and I agree with, the, with Lenka's point earlier about the need for investment in R&D for energy, but that R&D needs to be not just in improving the efficiency of solar panels and, and you know, tweaking around with the hub height of, of um, wind turbines. That's amazing and that's important, but that already gets done. We need to do innovation to develop applications that really solve the SDG problem. We need to do um, solar systems for um, clean cooking, but which are actually effective and, and allow people in places where they don't have access to clean cooking to actually use these cook stoves, not a one size fits all kind of model. Uh, we need innovation in solar water pumping, but again, in a sustainable manner such that water isn't just pumped out indiscriminately and can be combined with drip irrigation and other such applications. We need innovation in how do we move from old turbines or old um, solar panels to more effective and more efficient solar panels in a way that isn't cost prohibitive. And all of this is technology innovation, but it's not the innovation mold that we are currently living in. And so I think that if we were really to innovate in a way that is not the current mold of innovation, because innovation is not a word we came up with today. We need to continue innovating, but we need to also innovate in new ways. And that, I really think, is going to drive the revolution for renewable energy forward. Thank you, Kanika. Um, uh, very, very clearly on uh, uh, energy revolution or transformative change you want, if really want to have innovation in financing or innovation in policy or innovation. We have um, experienced different uh, parts of the world. You have been working for a consortium of scientists for sustainable development. You are working on project on desertification. 
you're also working on energy systems in your country, but also you have been part of a global alliance for clean energy in some ways. Tell us from your experience as of now, how you look at energy and climate change issues coming together, especially the role of nexus and innovation in that. And how do you feel it can provide answers to climate change? Please. Thank you very much, Pradeep. So uh, I'm going to share with you something very different. So how do we power those uh, social and environmental innovators out there in the field and the developing countries that have no access to what uh, this young lady beside me has been talking about, finance, access to credit, where they can really bring the green energy resources to those villages that are completely off the grid. So first, I want to start with the Paris Agreement, historic. I did not go to COPS again after Copenhagen collapse. I thought it's just a waste of time. So much of you know, hot air in a climate circus and nothing comes about. But uh, after Paris came in, uh, as an agreement last year, I was busy planting mangrove trees in Myanmar, but my colleague was there in Paris. I said, wow, there is a ray of hope at the end of the tunnel. And I'm glad that on the 4th of November, it actually came into force. So um, what happens now? Well, this is going to trigger a future regulatory change in economics through new policies affecting fossil fuel use, clean energy, and clean energy efficiency. There are our INDCs, but we need a new bottom-up approach, a people-led approach, not just a corporate or, or, or governmental top-down approach. How are people consulted on the ground, especially those who are below the poverty line, who are you know, deprived of energy? This will open up new challenges at the same time with and also open up opportunities for companies, big and small, small, medium-sized enterprise, who can innovate and provide the much-needed energy solutions, as well as traditional firms who can adapt in the new changing regulations in any country they operate. So what are the new opportunities that exist for us? Well, it will create energy, a lot of opportunities for companies, as, as well as SMEs, that can provide the true green solution and not just those business as usual, traditionally developed markets, but also help in countries like China, India, Brazil, or other low income countries that are really at the bottom of the pyramid segment, such as many African countries. But in order to help these companies to realize these opportunities, we need a quick intelligence gathering support with sound analysis from around the world so that these markets can be come into force, the green markets. I'm based in London. We operate in nine pilot countries, but I looked at the growth of the alternative energy companies on the London St Stock Exchange. There are 17 of them right now, and that was a couple of months ago. There might be more. So you can imagine there's a huge growth in these companies that are now listed in the London Stock Exchange. And out of, out of that, there are 14 alternative energy companies listed in the AMI. So the AMI is the alternative investment market and it's growing in the billions, which is amazing. What's AMI? AMI was created in 95 by the London Stock Exchange, principally as a uh, device range of small companies to give them an opportunity for sensibly raising capital in a regulated market. AMI companies come from 37 sectors, 90 subsectors in 26 countries, and it has over 250 companies outside the UK. So you don't have to be a British company to be on the AMI. This speaks volume because of the valuability of the AMI market as a place for younger international companies wishing to fund expansion and raise truly a global profile. So what happens? We've been working on the ground in Myanmar, in India and Sri Lanka, and we want to pitch something called a clean tech innovation program based on our pilot studies to really target the people below the poverty line. As you can see, the top three renewable energy technologies in the world, there is water, small hydro in, in Africa, which is green. There's bioenergy and water in Latin America. In Asia, there's onshore wind and SB uh, water programs and so on. But the top three are listed there. It's a huge oppor opportunities for small and medium-sized entrepreneurs. Look at the market size of the 15 top 15 uh, clean technologies. You have, you know, again, water, you have onshore, solar, photovoltaics, small hydro, water. It's just growing. It's huge. The SME share is huge, and the non-SME share is green. So what's happening at a global scale? Well, the World Bank came out with a report about building competitive 
green industries that illustrate the nature, which is likely the size of clean opportunities for F SMEs in 145 developing countries over the next decade. Well, in that time, expected investments could go across all those 15 technology sectors in these developing countries. It could top $6.4 trillion overall. Of that total market, 1.6 will be accessible to small companies that are operated by young people, such as my brother in South Africa, to really scale them up. Even when excluding China, Russia, and middle-income European countries, these opportunities exist are still significant. 4.1 trillion overall, of which 1 trillion is accessible to small, medium-sized industries. Hence, we want to create this new movement of creating low-tech innovative program and raise money from organizations like UNIDO, the Jeff program, and now we have the Global Green Climate Fund based out of Korea. So what are we doing with all this know-how? For the last three years, I've been working in Myanmar, Burma, planting two million trees in the Delta region with a grant we got for two million dollars from an origin foundation. We've been efficient enough to plant two million trees. But what's the problem? The Delta region has only 15% left of mangrove cover. A lot of trees have been cut down because of energy needs. The poor had no fuel and they chopped down mangroves to burn it for charcoal and also for energy production. But you can't go to that village and tell the father to top, cut, cut, stop cutting down trees if you don't provide them a green solution to sustain their livelihoods. So we've been working now with research partners. Of course, I met Jeffrey Sachs here. He wanted to give me an update of what we've been doing. And I work closely with Nicholas Stern, being from the LSE, but these guys wanted to see some tangible pilots that can be scaled. But having said that, there's an organization in London that call themselves the Social Stock Exchange, where all the green companies are listed. It's a place where impact investors hover around, where a lot of money is coming in, where they can finance the much needed capital for innovative projects run by young people in the developing countries. So these are the little guys that we're investing our time in a little village in Myanmar. We work with them because they are the future. They need to take care of the mangroves. We give them mangrove trees to plant, and we tell them if the mangrove trees survive, they get a bulb because they don't have electricity. But with that little bulb, innovative little solution, they can study, they can charge their mobile phone, and they can, you know, use it for the parents. They can work at night, and they can have cleaner livelihoods even in the middle of the night. But we want to also get all the charcoal producers to actually raise nurseries to plant mangrove trees, which can prevent floods, disaster from hurricanes, and, so, and create green jobs for these people. So we need to look at it from a whole holistic perspective. Green jobs through creating clean energy, restoring of mangrove ecosystems that suck five times more carbon than terrestrial trees, and providing livelihoods, because when mangroves exist, you get a lot of fish. So that's what we're doing, and I want to end by showing a little model of what I got from a lady who's working in the middle of DRC Congo and also now in Haiti. This is called a solar puff. She said, Bramley, I like what you do in Myanmar with those little balls, but it could break. Here's something more efficient for the little ones. A little solar puff, which can glow in the night. And she said, I'm going to raise enough money to get 100,000 of them to take with you to the land of gold. Because now the government of Myanmar said, great, you've done your research and you've done your pilot planting 2 million trees in 1,800 hectares. Here's 80,000 hectares. We need 320 million trees to be planted in the next 10 years. And there are 30 more villages that we can work with in the Delta region that are totally off the grid. So these little things can help them in the long run. So with that said, these are the people we're trying to address and the, below the poverty line, and we need your help. And I hope we can collaborate and take something off the grid and create those green jobs that are more sustainable on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bradley. Round of applause to all panelists present here. Now, of course, it was first statement from their side. Now, I think we should raise the temperature. Looking at business as usual to me, they are very convinced what they are doing. But of course, it's time to challenge them on some of the things they are they really they're convinced that the right way to go forward. And then, of course, that we need evidence, that we need more collaboration and other things. So before I really come back to them with second round of questions, I would like to now open the floor for the audience, because it's, you are present here. You have been listening to them for almost last 40 minutes plus. 
it will be very good to have your questions, comments, and please throw them to any panelist. And of course, then we come back. I will take a couple of questions from your side, and then we'll move into that. So could we have Mike, please? Uh, somebody, yes. Yes, uh, somebody, my colleague is coming now. Yes, Naveen. Uh, we can we can start with him or maybe from there first and then we'll come back to all questions now please introduce yourself be brief be focused and address to any panelists or all of them please okay my name is sebastian grove from uh, me social international um one question as the topic at hand is uh, sustainable energy access for all um i heard a lot of suggestions at least from a third or half the panel on centralized systems including nuclear power plants i didn't quite grasp the correlation between the centralized nuclear power plant with the theme of the session sustainable energy access for all as i guess we have seen in the last 60 years that these centralized power plants have never really done the job to get more people into uh, into the electricity scheme thank you for your question yes there's a second, and of course, there's a. Uh, thank you, uh, John Bickel from Peru. Uh, just uh, a question about the, the nuclear power. We we are talking about sustainable systems. How do you address the the nuclear waste? Uh, how do you recycle them and the, what is the idea to make it sustainable with the nuclear waste? Very good question. This is always when we talk about nuclear power that comes, I'm sure there'll be very strong answers to that. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, hi there. Thanks very much. Stuart Bruce from Cambridge University. Um, in addition to the nuclear waste, uh, a follow-up question is, how do you address the, the built-in costs and the time horizon to create nuclear facilities when we need to transition and reduce emissions immediately. Um, I understand there's an innovative idea for a sort of smaller reactors, but even so, depending on the size and the scale, etc. cetera. Um, second question is those in the solar and wind business. Um, what do you think are the top uh, legal barriers to change? If you've thought of this before, because we have policies, we have ideas. At the end of the day, we need effective regulatory systems and laws which allow this rapid scaling up, micro grids, functioning energy markets, etc. So, if you've thought of this, what do you think are some of the barriers, uh, the legal barriers or the regulatory barriers? Thanks very much. Good question. Yes, please. Uh, hello. Hi, I'm Oliver from uh, London. Um, yep. Hi. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A question to. Uh, Lenka and Eric, uh, thank you for your presentations. Um, when you talk about your, your innovation in, uh, in nuclear power, I wanted to know uh, how much water does this technology uh, use uh, per hour? Apparently, current uh, nuclear power plants use up to 10 million liters water, of water per hour, which means that you know these plants need to be built on coastlines. So if we are talking about a new power generation to address climate change, we're automatically assessing the risk of sea level rise. So is it a smart thing? Would it be a smart thing you know, to actually build uh, nuclear power plants on, on coastlines, knowing that there is the risk of sea level rise within this century? Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take one last question before we go back to panelists. Yes, please. Thank you. My name is Connor Fox from Hestian Innovation Limited. My question is to Kanika. How do we make cook stoves really sexy? Cook stoves? <laughs> Very interesting question, yes. <laughs> we are COP22, so we always get uh, different perspective from participants. So now uh, there are almost six, seven questions. Question is about um, centralized power plant versus decentralized systems. We are talking about nuclear waste. We are talking about solar and wind, especially legal barriers, water and nuclear power stations, cook stoves becoming sexy or more interesting. 
And of course, let me add one question here. Uh, if you refer to a recent book by Professor Rifkin, Zero Marginal Cost Societies, uh, in that he's, he feels like, uh, of course, when we talk about industry 4.0, we are talking about future. He believes that future will be driven not by technology, by the cost, and that's marginal cost of that technology. And why he feels that? Because when you scale up, the moment the cost goes down, that's the technology which will win the race at the end, if everything else is equal. Uh, and that's a good example was that uh, you have mobility, you have internet of things, and of course, uh, uh, like in the morning you get up, you charge your uh, electric car with the solar power, you go around, have meetings, use internet for connecting the world. In the evening, you come back, you have, again, your car has produced power, you put it back to the grid. So it means you have used zero, call, zero energy at the end of the day. You have done your bit, you have done your meetings, you have contributed to whatever your business you are doing. That is what zero marginal cost society. So it means we are really talking about very decentralized and centralized both together. So how do you really look some of the technology you mentioned? Because it's very clear that if you want to address issue of energy poverty and of course issue of climate change, we have to have mix of technologies mix of financing models, we mix of institutional approaches, mix of policy guidelines. So all these things together, but at the same time, we have to see how public perception works, what works on the ground, and how do we scale them up, and what are the barriers. And of course, I'm very happy somebody mentioned what the legal barrier. So now maybe I can start with Lenka. Of course, the first question came to you, so we can start with you. But feel free, I will go back to each one of you and uh, please take your three to four, not very long time, but give very precise. And maybe you can challenge each other also. I'll be very happy that if you can challenge any other panelist on the podium, whether what they're saying makes sense to you or not. Please, Lenka, floor yours. Thank you for your question. So I'll try to address uh, some of the nuclear questions that were asked and then uh, let Eric do some of the speaking as well. So first, um, in terms of cost, I hear that come up a lot with nuclear energy, and that is um, the primary thing that we're trying to change with our small modular reactor. And this comes from scalability, but also in changing the way that we finance and construct nuclear power plants. So what we're doing is building the actual module, the reactor, in a factory, and then shipping it on site. And so during that time, you can do the site preparation and the build construction of the actual power plant. Um, so this also reduces the time of construction and deployment, as well as the cost. And we're looking at numbers that will be, and this is for first of a kind um, power plant that we're building in the US, that will be competitive um, with fossil fuels. Not necessarily with natural gas, because that's quite cheap in the US right now, but at least with coal. And so in industrialized countries, our target is to replace coal-fired power plants. And since the infrastructure already exists in those areas, we cut down a lot on costs. And so once our first nuclear power plant is built, we'll have a factory that can uh, pump out these modules on a continual basis, um, orders that can come in, we can have some ready to be deployed. So we're significantly changing the way in which we uh, construct and deploy nuclear power plants to significantly bring down the cost. Uh, now on the, decent, on the centralized versus decentralized grid, something that uh, we've looked into is how our nuclear modules would be operated on a remote uh, grid, for example, or in countries and areas that don't have very good electric infrastructure. And what we see ourselves as being is actually a middle ground from countries moving from a microgrid to a macrogrid. Because we've never seen nations be able to industrialize without large access to electricity, without centralized grids. So I think this is a transition that will eventually need to happen in developing countries for them to become developed to the level of industrialized countries. And when you bring small amounts of electricity on a microgrid to a community, yes, they have a better quality of life, but they're still not able to use that small amount of electricity to bring 
industry to bring jobs into that area. So you don't necessarily see economic development. This is where we see the small reactors fitting in very well because they can bring a source of ele abundant electricity to a small area with a small grid. And while our design is 50 megawatts for one module, this can be scaled up to use uh, multiple modules on a site, or we're also looking into uh, licensing much smaller reactors that would be something along the lines of on battery level. And this is research that is happening in the US and around the world now. So this scalability exists in terms of being able to get nuclear energy to countries that haven't had it before that don't have good um, infrastructure for large scale plants at this level. Um, and also there was a question about the water usage with this technology. Uh, it's Nuclear power plants don't necessarily have to be at a large water source. You can create the water source that's there because the water that's used in a thermal plant goes in the plant and then is pumped out. And that same water source can be used in a continuous loop. They're actually generally located on coastlines because that's where the population is. That's where electricity is needed. So there will be a grander challenge in terms of rising sea levels um, with the population in those zones. We're actually building our first uh, power plant in Idaho, which is a desert region. So you don't need a large source of water to be able to build this plant. And Thank I'll you, Lenka. I think Eric. I'll let Eric uh, answer yeah. the waste question. Okay. If, uh, if uh, just one question here, Lenka, they are very good answers, but Eric, tell us from your public uh, perception, if things are so rosy, why the public perception around the world is not moving towards that? What do you think as a young generation, what can be done? It's a, it's a tough one, and now now we actually have uh, empirical data that shows us that the fear of nuclear energy is more dangerous than nuclear energy itself. Um, you take the long history of uh, nuclear plant operation, uh, going back to, to, to Chernobyl, and the best public health data we have from World Health Organization, from the United Nations Scientific Council on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, um, from the Chernobyl Tissue Bank, shows that the total amount of casualties uh, from nuclear power, uh, somewhere between 4,000 and 9,000 people. Uh, Fukushima, I, I hear it all the time. Uh, people think a lot of people died there. They, the tsunami, yeah, the tsunami, the huge earthquake, that killed about 17,000 people. As far as the uh, uh, radiation released from the plant, um, nothing. Um, the, the evacuation, that, that was not good. Um, that was, it was very hasty. And uh, now, four, four and a half, five years out, um, the World Health Organization has said with a high degree of confidence that it would have been better if those people in the hospitals uh, stayed there. Um, nonetheless, um, that's, that's something we're gonna have to deal with. And I think, I think the best, best way to deal with it is just to be real about the facts and information here. Um, so let's talk about waste, because that's another aspect of, uh, of the fear of, of nuclear that we're, that we're trying to overcome here with this grassroots movement. Um, so the waste, um, yeah, a lot of people think it's maybe in these like 55 gallon drums that maybe is uh, they're leaking. I, I certainly did from my experience watching The Simpsons. Um, but they're actually in these uh, very robust concrete storage casks. Um, I have a friend of mine, his name is uh, Jim, Jim Hoff, or, worked his entire career designing these storage <laughs> casts. And, and I, I, so I asked him, I was like, Jim, did they like, do you guys like test these to make sure they, you know, you know, what do you do to test these things? And he goes, well, uh, we drop them on spikes. I was like, are you serious? Yeah. And they don't break? No. So the, the way we store waste on site right now, um, even though it's a, a, a temporary um, solution, is is quite safe and um and i think i think worrying about nuclear waste right now at this point in history is kind of like worrying that your recycling bin is half full while your house is burning down um, and why did i say recycling bin instead of trash can um, i said recycling bin because um, many of the reactors some of which do exist today they have an operating fast reactor in russia um, and some of which will exist within the next few decades can use today's existing nuclear waste as fuel. And we can decrease the volume of it while making clean electricity uh, day in, day night, calm, windy, doesn't matter. Um, 
So I see that as a nice solution to the waste and uh, in our, our problems of uh, energy scarcity that are, that are ravaging you know, sub-Saharan Africa and uh, in India. Um, Let's see, time, time was another question somebody asked about, about how long it would take to, to scale up. Um, so I would just look, look to history for an example uh, on that one. Um, France was the fastest country in the world ever to decarbonize their electricity sector. It took them 14 years and they did it with nuclear power. Um, Germany, of course, is, has been going uh, gangbusters with uh, renewables here for the past 15 years. Um, and, um, and I think they should be applauded for that. And it, if they would have kept their nuclear online while doing that, they'd, they'd be in such a, such a good place right now. But as a result of, of, of basically trading out their nuclear for renewables, their emissions have uh, only, only declined roughly 3% in the last 15 years, um, uh, despite a tremendous investment. So I think if we try to do that on a global scale, and if we bet the planet on our ability to do that, we're, we're going to be really, really sad uh, come 2100 when we built all this renewable technology, but it still has to be backed up with natural gas. Um, you know, I, I'm not ready to bet the planet on uh, batteries uh, coming online and, and, and being cheap enough to, to work on a grid scale. Um, so uh, I think I'll just just mention the grid for a second. Um, I think decentralized is, is good good from a ro robustness level, but the, that really only helps you with, uh, with the residential kind of heating and cooling aspects. And there's still the industrial and transportation sectors, which are huge, uh, huge sources of carbon. So we need, to, we need to decarbonize all aspects of that. And we're gonna need the electricity grid to do that. Um, and uh, nuclear seems to be, looking at the data, nuclear seems to be the best way to do that. Good to see that, yes, Hanika, you would like to yeah. take on from here? You would like to add to what I'm saying or you moved in the cook stoves now? Okay, no, please. I also want to strongly disagree. Okay. Um, if we can't bet our future on battery technology that only needs to get cheaper, we should also not definitely bet our future on waste that may be stored safely, but we don't know what to do with it. Instead of using all of this land to store this nuclear waste, we can put panels on them and we can, there is already battery technology that is maybe not as cheap as it should be, but it's going to get there. That's just a technology learning curve. And if we are looking to history for everything, then we can look to history for this and know that it is going to get cheaper and it is going to allow renewable energy to be the most viable and a hundred percent renewable energy future is something that we can look to. But if I could quickly also answer some of the other questions. Um, yes, uh, historically grid connectivity has been the way that industrialized countries have gotten along on their, industrial, uh, their path of industrialization. The entire point of this panel and the need to move away from business as usual is because things the way they've happened historically aren't working out very well for us. So decentralized um, a decentralized sort of uh, energy system and an energy security where everyone is a prosumer is really something that can not only improve your quality of life, but it can also increase productivity. It can increase um, the, the value that is created uh, in terms of GDP terms. And, and, it's, um, and while, of course, there are concerns around um, how do you then decarbonize um, transport and things like that, um, there are we already have technology solutions for that. So I don't think that um, grid connectivity is an absolute necessity in the world today. Um, then there was a question around um, the, the timelines. And I'm gonna speak from the example of India. Um, so India's uh, nationally determined contribution commitment that was made in Paris last year says 40% non-fossil fuel um, electricity capacity by 2030. 40% means 320 gigawatts of um, non-fossil fuel capacity. We are currently at 84 gigawatts of non-fossil fuel capacity, of which about 10 or 12 comes from nuclear. We've had a nuclear program in place for several years now, and we know from, from what has gone on so far that just there is a lot of, um, there are several concerns and uh, that 
that retard the pace of nuclear. So there is, of course, like ethical concerns and people are protesting, but that's not what is really holding nuclear back. It's expensive. There's land acquisition. There's um, regulatory constraints that we were uh, we talked about in the context of renewable energy that are much more pronounced for nuclear. So we know that most of this 320 gigawatts is going to come from renewable energy. Renewable energy also has a much shorter feedback loop. Solar projects are commissioned, constructed, and operational in 12 months now in India, where a lot of the regulatory constraints continue to exist for solar, solar energy projects as well. So I think that that answer in itself sort of explains really what the future is going to look like. Um, the question around regulatory constraints, I think the, the greatest regulatory constraint, again, speaking mostly from a knowledge of India, but also generally in the world, is around um, the the... Um, PPAs uh, and, and sort of the, the default and, and delays on honoring of PPAs. And I think that if that regulatory, if there was regulatory support extended to that, so that, that, that um, the rule of law really in the context of PPAs was um, honored more strictly, that we would, uh, renewable energy would be able to accelerate in a much more um, rapid way. There would be much more investment. And the last question around um, cook stoves. If I knew two and a half billion people in the world would be cooking better and I'd be a millionaire because I think that the biggest problem really is we distorted the market by passing out free cook stoves. So what I know is what we should do is start getting people to pay for them because there is a willingness to pay for cook stoves and also taking, um, keeping sort of traditional values around cooking and, and cultural um, constraints that are the reason that cook stoves never really took off. Um, into account when cook stove sol cooking solutions are being um, presented. Thank you. Eric, just hold on. I think um, uh, this is a good debate we are starting, but I would like to give chance to all speakers first, and then we'll come back to you. Joe Pascal, could you tell us about solar and legal issues involved there? And what, what is your experience? Can we achieve terawatt dream with legal and other barriers for solar technologies? Yeah. Uh, I, I just want to... to, to correct something it's not a dream it's a, it's an objective uh, yes yes we can uh, even if uh, this would this expression is a, a little outdated now um, but yes we can and and that's precisely what we are working on and I, I'm very pleased that the legal or the regulatory question has been asked because precisely this is where uh, there is an issue but it's not uh, here again we have to be innovative in our mindset in the way we, we perceive things it's not, it's no longer a matter of, yeah, we should put in place regulations that will uh, give subsidies or, uh, or, or, or stop subsidies to other, other ones. It's not, it's not the point any longer. In any way, to get to, to the level, the, the magnitude that we need to reach, we, we just don't, we can't count on that. Um, so that, that, again, from a very entrepreneurial, sorry, point of view, uh, we looked at exactly everything that has to be done. And we look at the, the breakdown of the cost of solar electricity being uh, pointed out that when we get to $30 a megawatt, hour, it's so cheap that you open an economic space for other technologies that will help the management of the electron. Because the, 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 the system as it exists is a system where, where the, the, yeah. the generation of the electron and the management of the electron is the same thing. We thank, uh, linked to the way you produce it. Here, we talk about reducing that so low, the cost of generation of the electron with solar at 30 or, low, or lower dollar a megawatt, then compared to the rest, you open an upper economic space where you can, where you can have uh, batteries, hydrogen storage, uh, power to gas, uh, demand response, and all these kind of technologies that are not exactly generating electron, but that are managing the, the cheap electron that is generated by solar, and when you do, when you do that, it's a huge space for innovation. And maybe that's that's what uh, uh, Bill Gates was uh, thinking about when he said we need an energy miracle. I think he, he doesn't really understand exactly what he said, but the energy miracle is not on the generation uh, of the electron, but on the management of this electron. That said, how we get to the thirty dollars a megawatt or below? When you look at the costs. You see that there's a, the capex, the hard capex, the equipment is now acceptable. It will go lower, but it's fine. 
But there is a lot of soft capex, and soft capex are generated by what? By uh, inefficiencies, let's call that like, in the development process. And these inefficiencies come out of the regulation. The regulations um, have been made like 30, 40 years ago, and are not adapted, are not designed to help to reduce the cost of development. And these costs of development are very important and very important to apply to smaller scale projects. So that means that their impact on the cost of electricity is important. And when you get to better regulation, when you get to uh, very streamlined LCOE driven regulations, then you can really decrease the cost of electricity. And that's why we have launched at the right initiative, an initiative called Ambrogio. Ambrogio is, is the financial model based uh, approach which makes the cost of electricity, everything else being equal, a function of the regulation. And 21 items of the regulation that have been looked at, and then you go in a country, you screen their regulation, and you can see where does the other cost come from. And then you can help the government to choose and to design better their regulation, to choose their reforms on the way it would be more efficient in the, how to, to make the, this cost down. The second thing is the, it's, it's, it's the contractual practices of, of that we have uh, seen. Uh, and I am, a, I am a lawyer, and I've been spending like decade like discussing things which for me didn't make sense because we were just copy-paste uh, contracts that were designed for huge plants with very high technology and a lot of engineering and everything to something which is basically no more, no less than an IKEA closet. A solar asset is something which is built in a factory, a little like her nuclear reactors, which is put in a box, sent somewhere, ask someone to, to take a little key to uh, mount it and plug it, and that's it. It, does, it should not take like decades of negotiation to do that. When you go to the IKEA and buy a closet, you don't negotiate the contract with IKEA. So same thing for solar. And when you and again, it's huge transaction costs that are rising out of these bloody contracts. When you get rid of that, when you make it simple, have a standardized contract, that makes it much more simple and much more cost efficient. And that's the reason why in June we have launched with Arena, we are, which we are a partner of. We, we have launched the SESI initiative, which is a solar energy standardization initiative, which is basically designing, redesigning a suite of contracts from development to OEM, PPAs, and financing, which are much more simple and much lighter than anything that exists for the moment. Again, a huge uh, uh, economy in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in, in the transaction costs. But last and last, really the, best, the biggest uh, source of cost, especially for developing and emerging countries, is the cost of, of the capital. And then the only, the, only way, the only solution that we see to tackle this issue and this is to have a, a credit enhancement mechanism, a very uh, simple, uh, I would say, insurance product that would help to tackle uh, counterparty risk, uh, uh, credit risk of the, on the uptaker, political risk, stability of the country, and forex risk, stability of the currencies. Then if you have that, and we, we call that GREG, to make it simple. GREG is Global Renewable Energy Guarantee. When you get, you get that, you have, like Kanika like said, a huge leverage effect on public money. And then you can deploy with a limited amount of money, uh, of public money, a huge chunk of uh, very affordable solar electricity. So we are working on these three uh, items and it's an open initiative, so anyone who wants to contribute to that is very welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, John Pascal, for, for your experience. Uh, there's some speaker, they want to raise some intervention. Please be very brief. We are coming to an end to this uh, session very soon, and we have two speakers, Paseko and Bremley, here to speak and respond to some of the questions. Please, can you be loud, please? Yeah, so... Uh, Thank you so much for the presentations, everyone. I just have a comment and a question. We are at COP22, 2016, and I think the human mind and the human culture has to build on past experiences. And I am wondering if the speakers 
just didn't really use the how to say the updated uh, uh, measure or scale to really showcase the best practices that are now available for the human race to really move on to a better and brighter future. Uh, the idea that we are we have it, we have a cheap a cheap technology doesn't justify the use of it because we know that the nuclear uh, energy even though cheap or has worked in the past it has caused in many places dramatic uh, damages to the people to the communities and to the biosphere and ecosystem so i'm just wondering if we should use how many lives have been killed by a certain nuclear like the idea of 4,000 people being dead because of a nuclear damage is really, for me, not the criteria. We should be looking for a higher standard in choosing how to answer our needs and how to move on. And also, we know that the, like, upscaling, just the, it doesn't, you know, using the economical uh, argument of, like, it's cheap, it will help development. There are other energy sources that could fuel development. We know that Germany, they're moving towards a cleaner energy. They're moving away from nuclear because they have learned a lesson from what happened in Japan. So I'm just, I just want us as a, you know, upscaled new technology, uh, you know, looking for solutions to really use appropriate criteria to really pick what's right now from moving on. Thank you. Thank you. Good points. Yes. Uh, last comment from the audience before I go to Paseko and Bremley first. And Eric, I'll come back to you at the end. But be brief. Yes, please. Um, my name is Noah Kabir from Microenergy International. Um, I've been working in the space of access to energy for the last 15 years. And this is a question to the moderator or the person who have organized this panel. So. For me, it's somehow new that nuclear power plays a role in the energy access scenario, SDG 7. I didn't know that SDG 7 applies to France and Germany. So um, please educate me in what nuclear power, and there are a lot of arguments which I don't want to go in, and what does it have to do with SDG 7, and how are we going with any kind of nuclear power provide energy to rural areas. And I'm really curious, I really admire the two speakers on the left side and on the right side, who are those who are working in this SDG 7 field. Yeah, how do you feel? Good question. And I think so that can debate, we can sit here for a whole night, but <clears throat> very good questions. Please remember SDG 7, focuses on sustainable energy fall. <clears throat> and in that affordable, yes, access energy is one of the goals for SDG 7, but other two goals are renewable energy and energy efficiency linking to access. Now, when we say access to energy, it can be from any means, provided it is environment friendly, it is clean energy, and it is reducing emissions. So we are addressing energy poverty issue and climate change. I mean, we are not uh, using fossil fuels there or any any kind of energy systems which are not tackling then climate change. But please remember, for transitional technologies in many countries like India, China and others, coal, even coal will be continue to be used for the time being. But the challenge is how to make it clean coal technologies for the transition also so that we do not uh, have the effect of climate change. But yes, we can have debate on that. But let me go to... Paseko and Bremley, then from your experience, from your innovation, linking energy. Remember, energy is a means and itself is service we want. We want light, we want water, we want better health, space heating. So energy is a means. Remember, energy can come from any source. So the more importantly, it's a means. And that's what I think the Paseko uh, gave a very good example of how energy systems can become well, help in water efficiency, cleaning water, and how we can address energy efficiency through water use and water recycling. So please tell us, uh, in like, please take a couple of minutes, uh, two, three minutes to really give that nexus here. Thank you very much, Program Director. I'd like to, to propose a shift of mindset a bit in the spirit of uh, business unusual. 
It, um, the, the main argument right now is within the nuclear space. There was an issue of how to handle the waste. There's an issue of uh, the time, the turnaround periods to that extent. Now, research and development is quintessential. Research and development uh, opens up new possibilities. We have untapped industries as we speak, which are explored by somewhat billionaires. The likes of Elon Musk and Richard Branson, they're exploring the, you know, the space industry. Why can't we think of other ways of disposing such nuclear waste maybe in that industry? Such waste could probably be used as a fuel for that industry. Or we could explore the universe in general. Yes, this is just business unusual, right? This, is, this was the whole uh, nexus, how, how to think out of the box. The main fact that we conceive this vo box is, is because we are in it. So if we continue with the research and development, we will allow ourselves to explore other opportunities and other industries in, in, in a way that will help us to avoid such arguments and create new possibilities. That's one point. Another point I'd like to address is that the, the nature of, of problems is that those who bring them forth also bring them forth from an element of fear. Now, those who do have solutions also have fear to propose these solutions. As much as I'm making bold statements, I'm making these statements because if we do not explore these things, then we might not find the viable solution among us. If we were to have a platform to have more trial and error with such wastes or such situations, there might be other possibilities. Take for instance, when I started off with my innovative journey, I always had this concern that someone will steal my idea. But I also got to acknowledge that the wealthiest grounds on earth are the cemeteries. That's because many ideas are buried there. And one of them is probably how to deal with such situations. So if, just to catapult the, the whole initiative, if the likes of the UN private sector and government was to have another framework to safeguard people's ideas and give them a platform to scale accordingly, we would probably have more things to discuss about besides how to deal with this waste. So in retrospect, I'm raising this because it's very clear none of these issues were posed to me and I thought I should be the wild card to change the frame of thinking. Without further ado, Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much. I think that's the whole approach I wanted to say that. It's a mindset when we want to look at business unusual. And that's any technology, any system. But yes, it should be pro-poor, it should be pro-environment, and it should be reaching out to energy and climate change challenge <coughs> that we face. Bramley, over to you. Give us from Thank your you. perspective some questions or some thoughts like Thank, has done it. Thank you, Pradeep. Uh, from my experience working with the least developing countries and you know, working with small island states, I don't think nuclear will work for them, not even the small grid, because we live in a very volatile planet. Look at it from a security point of view. When you have this kind of technology, what kind of security you need to put on it if it becomes a terrorist target to blow up such plants, which they are, big or small. So there's a potential for high alert, and you need to spend a lot of money on that. But what we haven't addressed is all the indigenous lands around the world where the actual mining of that uranium occurs for the last 50 years, they've been decimated. Those people are living, living in abject fear and poverty, even though the mining is happening on them. And some of them are facing like lots of cancer. Their water is contaminated. France gets its, its uranium from Niger. What about the uh, uh, native lands where the United States mines uranium or Canada or even Australia, the Aboriginal land? You don't hear about that. Those lands are decimated. Those populations, those lands belong to indigenous people. What about their rights? 
They don't want that nuclear energy. They don't need. What is sustainable development? Do we need to consume like all Americans and Europeans and industrialize? No. We want to have a sustainable green growth. You need to create green jobs that are in harmony with the planet. How much jobs can you create from nuclear energy? If you want to give jobs, it's about giving power to the people. And I suggest that we train a whole new generations of young renewable energy entrepreneurs that are off the grid that can provide clean, decentralized power to the people of their villages. Instead of paying governments for bringing wires from miles away that don't work anyway when a storm comes, it's useless. I work in villages that gets built with no electricity from the government. They say, what the hell is this? So, but if you create entrepreneurs that live in those villages to have microgrids from small hydro or wind or solar or biomass or, you know, special kind of bioethanol that we are working with the Indian Institute of Technology in Assam, Center of Energy, from agricultural waste. India is a predominantly agricultural country. A lot of waste is created from agriculture. We can actually use the pineapple peelings to create bioethanol and power all those communities. And my state in India has, has a lot of uranium. And one lady owns like 10 mountains and the governor of India came with a suitcase said, give your land to us. Here's $350,000. She said, take your money and shove it. I'm not giving because I can't eat money. What am I going to tell to my great grandchildren when I'm dead and gone, you know? So the tailing ponds in a place like Chirapunji, which gets 55 feet of rain a year, can you imagine all the slopes, the rainwater coming down from those mighty waterfalls, washing down through the tailing ponds, I fear that all my brothers and sisters in Bangladesh will be eating radioactive rice or some sort of contamination. So that will be a violation of international law. Mining on one side of the border and all the rivers and streams flowing downhill to another country completely contaminated. So that's not fair, just for the, you know, the needs of one country. So we need to look at different countries, what they need. And if you really want to create green dream jobs for those young people living in developing countries, I think a combination of wind, solar, small hydro, biomass, biofuel, and using agricultural waste is the way to go so we can really give power to the people, decentralized power. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ramli. It's very, like very provocative statement. Yes. I, I think we're wasting our time arguing about different technologies. And I think this is the fault of the UN in terms of not taking a leadership role in energy. There is no agency, one agency, one place that is working on SDG 7, which is why you see so many differing views on this panel. It's because it's been siloed into different agencies. There's an atomic agency, there's UNIDO, there's C for all. We're going to need to create energy systems of the future using as much technology as we can get our hands on. The fact is that 10,000 people are dying from coal every single day. That's not okay. We talk about deaths from radiation. Of course, we can talk about the pros and cons of every technology. We can go on and on about the mining impact. Solar actually has a larger mining impact per megawatt than nuclear. So I think we're completely wasting our time by arguing about technology. No. We need leadership from the UN to okay. tell us that uh, there's a really big issue here with no. energy access. And Len that's something Lenka, that the UN um, has lacked. I must say that uh, here, when we brought few people on board, it was not to waste time. It's simply to have our future leaders to give us the thoughts. In UN system, we are very clear how the systems are moving how policies are moving, what funding is required, what policies are required, yes. We do not have a UN energy because please remember, UN system is what member states want. Like Paris Agreement was not because UN wanted it. Paris Agreement, the global community wanted it. So please remember that. SC for all, Sustainable Energy for All initiative has been created because there is no one agency. Because remember, energy is a very diverse Energy is like finance. It's the diverse resources, diverse systems. Not one agency can handle all energy systems. It has to be done by all agencies, all partners, all financial institutions, everyone. And this is the issue. It's a cross-cutting issue. It's SDG 7, but also a cross-cutting issue in every way. But uh, I will leave that for future debate. But yes, Eric, I promise, be very brief, because we have to close this session. This was already 8, but I'm very happy. We have raised some temperatures and I really like uh, debates like that because even if we are not able to answer all questions, at least we are raising those issues which are yet to be answered by global community, including UN. Eric, over to you. Be all quick. Right. All right. Thanks, Pradeep. Um, 
Yeah, I guess, I guess what I'm, I'm sad the person who asked me that question left because I've, I've I thought it was just the perfect, the perfect opportunity to, again, just demonstrate how fear of nuclear kills more people than nuclear does itself. Um, she said, why don't we be like Germany? Well, Germany, their energy minister, just less than a month ago, said that they would continue to burn coal uh, until at least the, the 2040s and, and possibly beyond that. Um, the last slide of my presentation, I showed the, the carbon intensity of the two countries like there, there are empirical reasons um, to make decisions one way or the other on energy, and that's that's what what I'm trying to do in my advocacy here is is limit it to what what does the data say? Um, the land question. Um, I think I think uh, Kanika was surprised when I when I pulled out this. She 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 mentioned that nu nuclear waste is going to take up a lot of space, and she was surprised when I pulled up this graph in here and showed that it's it's on the order of uh, you know. 30 to 200 times less space than renewables technologies. And that if you, if you took the uh, entirety of nuclear waste from US uh, power production and put it on a football field, uh, it, would, it would be around uh, six to seven meters, 20 feet, 20 feet high. Um, so th there, are, th there are empirical facts about all of these technologies um, and we need to make pragmatic decisions about how we produce power and not, not let all this fear and misinformation lead us down the wrong way. Because I, I, we don't have time to make a mistake at this point. Um, so I just ended with that. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I think uh, all of the panelists need a very good round of applause for all of you. And <laughs> wonderful young people, some with some experience, but uh, that's, that's the zeal we want. And also a round of applause to these uh, diehard colleagues present here at this hour of 8, eight o'clock in the night but part of COP22. Thank you so much for this part of revolution. Thank you. I also must thank my colleagues, the Takeshi, Nagasawa, and Hiroshi, and others, Niveen, Danila. They have been helping me. And of course, all other partner agencies present here, including REN21, uh, who was very, uh, Laura was very kind enough to chip in from their side into this panel. Thank you so much.